Okay, so I am going to start filming the um, Eternal Punishment or Eternal Damnation video. Uh, this is Let's Rightly Divide This Part 8, I think. Um, this may end up being several parts, just like the uh, Let's Rightly Divide This Rapture. Uh, we'll see how it goes. i got a bunch of tabs open up here. I have Eternal Punishment. I have Eternal Damnation. Eternal Torment. Hell. Hades, Sheol, Gehenna, you know, oh, that's a different one. So there's lots in the Bible about this. So this is the great thing about a subject like this, is that we don't have to guess about anything. There's so much in there, just like the rapture. People misunderstand. They, they misunderstand about uh, hell being real and hell being eternal also, and the punish being, punishment being eternal. Um, now the biggest question is, well, how can God torture people? Well, he doesn't torture people. Well, how can God condone them being there forever when it was just a short lifetime and they were doing that? It's not about that. Like he, people keep getting hung up on normal everyday sin. It's not about that. Satan and his angels are the reason why these places were created. He had to have a holding area for them. That's what they deserved because they made a decision to not choose God. They turned away from him. That place was only meant for them. Now here's where everything gets haywire. People, because this whole life is for us to choose God, make the decision. He's making it so easy for us. But there are people who aren't going to choose Him. Hey! There! Go ahead now. Sorry, guys. It's what happens when you put too many big animals in a small house. I have no say-so over it. So, um, where are we at? Let me get my thought back here. Oh, um, so people ask, you know, all the time, well, how can... How can uh, a just God and a loving God do this to his people? Well, you have to choose him. That's why he made it so easy to make the decision. You either choose or you don't. You either believe or you don't. It's that simple. There are people who don't even know, who don't even realize that they actually believe they're going to end up in heaven because they really do believe he's real. It's something that happens in here. Um, there's, there's lots of people that know about it but don't believe. Um, uh, there's tons of archaeologists. They've, they've seen the evidence that Jesus walked this earth. No archaeologist worth his salt can say Jesus wasn't a real person. They've seen the evidence. They have it. they got stuff with his name on it. So, knowing about it is one thing, but believing is a whole other story. Now, if um, people willingly, here, here's the whole thing, and this also goes back to do babies go to heaven. When people make the conscious decision, think about what I'm saying here, the conscious decision to avoid God, to turn away from Him, like Satan and his angels did, they earn that place of torment because it's not about God sending them there, is they choose it over Him. There are people who are very aware, just like they know about Jesus, they also know about hell. They put, they go like this, I don't, I don't want to know about it, la 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 la. They willfully and consciously choose otherwise. That's why they end up there. Because they're making the same uh, decision, same mistake, Satan and his angels did. Now, God isn't going to change it and, and do work in partiality. He's not a God of partiality. He's not going to change it to be softer on people who don't agree with it. It's eternal punishment, period. Eternal beings can't be destroyed. So if it, an eternal being ends up in a place of eternal punishment, you know, it, it's pretty much a two plus two situation. Now, we are eternal beings in that our flesh is not eternal, but what's dwelling inside the flesh is eternal. It has to go somewhere. You have a decision to make. You either choose light or you choose dark. You choose dark by default by not choosing light. Now, God is a just God. People are going to get a fair shake on this. It's not going to be a, a, a condemnation thing because you didn't know, you didn't read, you didn't this, you didn't that. He gives everybody plenty of opportunity 
and plenty of, of chances because of his righteousness that they can choose. But you have to make the choice. And this is where people get tripped up is that, they, well, I don't want to believe that it's real because, you know, that way my family just burns up. Or even um, some people I've talked to said, well, I'm, I want to take their place so they can go to heaven because I love them so much. Uh, and they do this with the thinking or they create the thinking. I'm just going to go there and I'm going to get vaporized and that'll be the end of it. It'll be a moment of intense pain and that's over. That's a cop-out. That's a cop-out and a denial of the truth. You have to be honest with yourself. This whole situation, nobody likes to think about it. But the thing is, it's real. And it's the truth. And it's all over the Bible. And we see constant stories about this stuff. That's why when you read about what happened with people who, in the Old Testament, before Jesus came, there was two different groups of people. Some that went to Sheol. Some that went to hell for torment. And some that went to Abraham's bosom. <coughs> Why? you got to ask yourself, why did God make two different places? Why didn't everybody go there? There's a reason why. Okay, so we're going to start with eternal punishment, and we're going to see where we end up. Matthew 25, 46, And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Well, who's this? These. Who are these? Matthew 25, 46. All right. So, there's Matthew 25, 46, at the end of the chapter. Let's go up to the beginning of the thought. Here's, okay, there's a parable. It looks like a parable there. Yeah, the parable of the talents. The parable of the talents is a good one. I've done that one, I think. Okay, so we're going to read Final Judgment, Matthew 25, starting in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. Wait a minute, all the holy angels? I thought... Ten thousands of his saints were coming back. Oh, they're like angels. This goes back to the rapture one. See, he will sit on his throne in glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. The sheep and goats judgment happens at the end of the tribulation. I got people arguing with me about this. Read the Bible. When you read Matthew 24, read Matthew 25 also. They go hand in hand. He's going to divide sheep and goats. Verse 33, And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come you, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. This is not the church. This is not the people that get raptured. These are the people that make it through the tribulation. This is, there's going to be a resurrection at the end. That's who these are. Why would we have to go through this judgment? We've already been taken. See what I mean? If you didn't, don't understand about that, go watch the, the three rapture videos. It's all on a playlist in the, in the playlist tab of the, video, of the channel. Verse 36, I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? You think about what's going to go on in the tribulation, and think about who in their, in their narcissistic attitude are going to do this for other people. Only those who believe. Verse 38, when did, you see, when did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when do we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So what we do, our good works, what we do unto others, there's going to be a repercussion for that. Christ is watching what we do to others. How we treat others, how we take a go out of our way, if somebody needs help to try to help them, that's the stuff he's talking about. It's not about a sandwich and some glass of water and a visit in prison. It's about you taking the time to be a benefit to others. Verse 41, Then he will say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Let's see. Now remember what they said in the actual parable. Because this isn't the parable. This is a supplemental scripture to the parable. In the parable, what did they say? Lord, Lord, because not everyone says to me, Lord, 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 look at what we did in your name. Look at all these things that we did. They were fake Christians. They were pretending to be Christians. False prophets, false apostles. They will, be, they will exist in the tribulation. That's who all this is. 
Then he will also say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed. So they're cursed. That's a one big indicator about what's going on here. They willfully chose to go against God into the everlasting fire. Fire never goes out. If everybody gets burned up, why is there still a fire? Prepared for the devil and his angels. And when you read about this, as we go through this, you've got to use some contemplative understanding. You have to think about these things. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Why did he say the punishment is everlasting if it's not? What does everlasting punishment mean? What does everlasting mean? Let's go to the Greek. Let's see what the Greek has to say about it. Everlasting, G166, Ahionios, perpetual. But that's not burned up and done, perpetual. Also used of past time or past and future as well. Eternal, forever, everlasting world began. So, it's it's a, a not a well, we're gonna we're gonna throw you in there and then you know you're gonna go this long and then poof, you cease to exist. That is a false doctrine because it goes directly against guys. We're just covering one verse so far. It goes directly against scripture. We're only one verse into this and and we clearly can prove that that's that idea that annihilationism is wrong. It's just people who don't want their feelings hurt. They're not facing the truth and facing the facts of this. And the, no matter how much you deny it, it doesn't make it any less true. That's why I'm doing this series of videos. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Everlasting punishment, it's forever. It's eternal. That means when you, if you get sent there, you're going to be there forever, for eternity. It will never end. This, this is the repercussions of the decision you make to deny him and turn away from him. There's only one other place you can go. So the decisions you make show where you end up. It's that simple. So, just with this one verse, we can prove this argument's done. But we're not. We're going to beat this thing to death. We're going to hit this so hard, just like the rapture and all the other one videos I did. We're going to hit it with so much scripture that there can be no way of denying it, because then you're going to have to deny all that stuff that the Bible says about this stuff. We're going to rightly divide this. So let's rightly divide this. Um, Matthew 25, 41, we did that. Okay, Revelation 20, 10. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and false prophet were, and they were tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelations 20.10. Yeah, I said Revelations. Because I can. Okay, so, uh, the first is the thousand years, first group of scriptures, and from verses 7 to 10 is the defeat of Satan. And that's where the... Um, the verse that we're looking at is in. I, but we're going to cover also the few verses, the six, five verses below it. Uh, the judgment before the great, 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 the great white throne. I keep wanting to go Elmer Fudd. Revelation 27, now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. This is the end of the millennial reign. And will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. So this is, that's where we're going to be at. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. The false prophet is supposed to be cast in there alive in his, in his flesh form. Well, if, and that was at the beginning of the thousand year reign. So they've been there for a thousand years. The beast and the false prophet are there. Wouldn't it be, if they were burned up and, and annihilated, wouldn't that be they were there where they were? No, they are. That meant they're still there. 
and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. But Mr. Christian, that doesn't say anything about non-believers. Oh, we're not there yet. See, this is where rightly dividing. This is where contextual understanding comes into play. You must keep reading to get the full thought and the full understanding. This is where people stop and they say, see, it doesn't talk about non-believers. Like Billy Mays Hayes, but wait, there's more. Judgment before the great, the great white, great white throne. Revelation 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great... <sighs> then I saw a great white throne. i got to slow down. <laughs> and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead. Listen to the words. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. So everybody, all the people who had not been resurrected up to that point are now resurrected. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works. This is all the dead. By the things which were written in the books. If hell or Sheol or Gehenna isn't eternal, that's not the lake of fire, they're two different places. If they're not eternal, where are all these dead coming from? Purgatory doesn't exist, but annihilationism hints that purgatory does exist. That's Catholic teaching. Purgatory doesn't exist. Where were these people at? In hell, being tormented. They weren't burned up. Now listen to this. This is more hints and clues. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades, holding areas for the dead that died without Christ, Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. If annihilationism was true, why are all these dead still present? They should have already been burned up, right? Guess they weren't. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. How can you say annihilationism is true? How can you say that when you get sent there, you just get vaporized as, as a being a human? When, first of all, your flesh doesn't go there, it goes to the grave. So that means the other part of you, the inner man, goes there. Second of all, if that happened, just like they, they say it does, who are all these people? Where did all these dead come from? They didn't come from the tribulation. Some of them did. That's from the very beginning of all things. And we see hints of that when we read about the rapture, too. But not all the dead were raised. And that scripture talk, is talking about before the tribulation starts. Not all the dead were raised. So, who are these people? This right here leads you to understand that evidently they were hanging out there for a while. Uh, over a thousand years or more. 2 Thessalonians 1.9 They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. 2 Thessalonians 1.9 I can stop right here and say this is d done. We've proved it. We're going to keep going. So we have several little groups there. The judgment at Christ's coming. What judgment is this? At Christ's coming. Is that the second? Let's read it and see. Verse 5 which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer. Okay, so that... There's the beginning of the thought up there. Okay, let's keep on going. Verse 6, Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. So now we're seeing more consequences of decisions being made. People who are going against God's people, people who are going out of their way to torture and mock and scoff and rail against us, there's a payment coming for that. God's going to repay them. And it's a righteous act. And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to take vengeance on them in flaming fire. These are people who decided not to choose God. 
There's a punishment for that. How many of the... He chose the Jewish people out of the world when they were in exile in Egypt, rescued them, and then killed almost all of them in the desert. Why would he rescue them to kill them? They didn't choose him. They chose otherwise. They chose the golden calf. He had no choice in the matter. It was a righteous punishment for an unrighteous decision. Verse 9, These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. It's existence without God. Right now, you think your life's bad now? Imagine if God wasn't governing your life, how bad it would be. It will be existence without God. That means anything possible can happen to you. And it lasts forever. It's everlasting destruction. How can you misunderstand everlasting destruction? That doesn't mean everlasting destruction till it stops. It's everlasting. It keeps going. Verse 10. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Therefore we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith and power. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. In a lot of the epistles you see many prayers very similar to this. Why are they praying so much for them about their faith? Because back then, a lot of people still stayed under the law. They couldn't have full faith and trust in Christ. The law was too prevalent then. The church only really started to grow after the second temple was taken down. Because what that did was that took the temple off the radar. People weren't doing according to the law. So as those traits fell away, more faith in Christ came. See? You start to think about why certain events happened the way they did, and then go back and look in history and see when the population of the church exploded. It exploded right, like 100, 150 years after that. really started to pick up because all that generation that was stuck in law died off. And the kids turned to faith instead. And as they grew up, they taught otherwise, and the church really started to grow. During the beginning, the church didn't grow hard at all. They were killing all of them. They were sending them out everywhere and persecuting them. It was after that, that second temple was taken down, and that, that generation died off, that everything started to change for the better, and the church excuse me, got bigger. Church was really big by 350 AD. Really big. It was everywhere. But it wasn't until that law was taken out of the way. Many of these people that were getting saved during this time frame that the apostles were on the earth, up to, what, about 95, like a 95 or 96 A.D., when all the apostles were on the earth, many of these people were still hanging out in legalism. They couldn't fully put their faith. Most of the people that were saved at that time were Gentiles, because they could, but they didn't have a law. They understood it's all through faith. They had the greater faith. The Jews had a hard time giving that stuff up until it was taken away from them. Then they started coming around. Then the church really got big. So, that prayer talks about all the is it gives you a hint on all the issues they were having back then, and how it sounds like well unless you stay in faith and unless you really were saved. See nowadays, it's pretty easy to tell. Back then it wasn't because a lot of people were still struggling with law. They were struggling with legalism. It was a bad problem in the beginning of the church. It was all about getting this frame of mind, this frame of thought out of the people and putting a new one in of going to the Savior. So people had to make a decision. They either had to choose God, which wasn't the law. They had to choose God, which was Jesus, or choose otherwise. A lot of them chose otherwise, and they ended up in eternal torment because of it. Many of those will be judged. Even Jews are going to be judged on that day. The white throne judgment. So this punishment, this is everlasting destruction. It's forever. Part of the reason why you see prayers like this in the Bible and why you see them constantly just harping on you need to believe, you need to examine yourself to make sure you believe, because they knew, because many of these men had very detailed understandings about what went on down there. Some of them even saw it. They don't talk about it much in here, but they harp on you need to be saved. What did Solomon say in Ecclesiastes 12? You better find the Lord before that silver cord breaks, before you die. You better get it right now. Because if you don't, you're going to end up in this place. And it's horrible there. 
It's designed to be that way. It's an incentive. You know, prisons, when they had the work gangs and all that, people worked really hard to stay out of jail. Now that you got cable and ramen and you can sit back and relax and they got Xbox and all that kind of stuff in there and air conditioning, there's guys that run businesses out of prison. They stay in prison and they run businesses out of, out of there online. One, one dude here a couple years ago I was watching, he goes, yeah, I'm about to get out, but uh, we're going to see how that goes. I, I might just stay, go ahead and stay out this time. He goes, I got three construction businesses I'm running. Really? He goes, oh, yeah. He goes, I got $25 million in the bank. This is a criminal. And he's running three businesses from prison. There's no incentive to stay out. It's easier in there. Some people, uh, there's a, a, a older women, not elderly, but older women, they go break the law just to go back to prison because it's a bed and free meals and free medical. They go to jail just to get the free stuff. They don't have a house on the outside. There's no incentive anymore. If we take the idea of an eternal punishment in darkness away from God out of the equation, there's no incentive to be saved. I can just do what I want and enjoy it and then go get vaporized. How many people do you think in their... In their um, arrogance and in their pride are going to choose that over God. A bunch of them. Annihilationism is a dangerous understanding because it gives people the sense that they don't have to be saved. Well, if my spirit just goes to God, I have nothing to worry about. No, you do. That's why they harp on it so much. Don't choose hell. How do I choose hell? By not choosing God. It's that simple. People need this understanding about hellfire because if they don't have it, they don't understand the urgency of them getting saved right then. Because if you're street preaching and you're talking to somebody and you don't talk about everything the right way and you don't get them convinced and they don't receive it right then, well, you know what, can you give me some gospel tracks and I'm going to take off? The second they step off that curve, bus hits them and kills them. Did you, what did you do for them? Nothing. Their life was required of them right then. And they didn't receive it. Because we're not telling people of the urgency of how they need to get saved. This isn't a popular message. That's why churches don't talk about it anymore. That's why you don't see a lot of people on YouTube talking about it anymore. This isn't popular. Because people don't want to think about that. But here's the problem with that. If you're denying that, what else are you denying? What, what other hard lesson are you denying? See, when you're saved, you're sealed. Done deal. But you got to get saved first. But if there's no incentive to get saved, who's truly going to do it? Who might just take on the mantle and pretend they are? See, this is all satanic. This is all Luciferian. He doesn't want you to believe that hell is eternal. He knows it is. He was probably there when it was being created. He don't, he don't want you to know about that. That way you don't get saved. That way you're down there with him. And all those people will be there with him. In fact, there was a... There was... Let me see if I can find it. Give me just a second. Let me see if I can find this scripture. Okay. Please forgive me. But in order for me to tell you about this, I have to use some scripture from the Old Testament. I know I said I wasn't going to do that. Um, but this isn't to prove the eternalness of hell. This is going to show you something very different. This is why we need to study the Old Testament, because there's a lot of interesting things being said in here. A lot of people don't know about this scripture and don't talk about this scripture. But watch what this is talking about. This is extremely eye-opening. And it, it doesn't talk about the subject matter of this video. It does hint at it. But this is going to show you something way different. And a lot of people don't know this. I've asked people about this and they have no idea this exists. We're in Isaiah 14, 9. So please forgive me for using Old Testament. I said I wouldn't, but you need to know this because this is why the book of Isaiah is such a good book. Starting in verse 9, Hell from beneath is excited about you. They meet you at your coming. It stirs up the dead for you. All the chief ones of the earth. It has raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. So hell is talking about all the people that are in it. So evidently they didn't get burned up. They all shall speak and say unto you, Have you also become as weak as we? Have you become like us? Your pomp is brought down to Sheol, and the sound of your stringed instruments, the maggot is spread under you, and worms cover you. 
How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How are you are cut to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. He had pride and arrogance in, in buckets. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you. Where are they seeing him at? We just said in verse 15. And consider you saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble? Who shook kingdoms? Who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities? Who did not open the house of his prisoners? All the kings of the nations, all of them sleep in glory, everyone in his own house. But you are cast out of your grave like an abominable branch, like the garment of those who are slain. Thus, through, thrust through with a sword, who go down to the stones of the pit like a corpse trodden underfoot. You will not be joined with them in burial, because you have destroyed your land and slain your people. The brood of evildoers shall never be named. Prepare slaughter for his children because of the iniquity of their fathers, lest they rise up and possess the land and fill the face of the world with their cities. And it keeps going on, keeps going on, keeps going on. How descriptive is that? Saying that the people that are in hell are going to see Satan when he gets cast in there before the thousand year reign and chained to the wall. And they're going to be looking at him like, really? This is the guy? This is who has been tormenting us? And I look at you now, and now you're down here with us. Just like we are. So, again, I didn't want to use Old Testament to prove it, but it does prove it, again. But, how interesting that they're going to actually, people are going to see Satan in hell. Well, if they're burned up, how are they seeing them? So I'm just, I'm just saying. That, I really needed to use that one because of uh, a lot of people miss this, this group of scriptures. Isaiah gets you a lot of insights into the future. But, um, how interesting that is. And you know, the first time I read that, that struck me. They're actually going to see him and they're going to communicate with him. So, how interesting. How interesting that is. I'm going to go back and highlight those later. So, I mean, at this point, we've proved it. <laughs> we've proved it. So, let's go through and let's look at some more. Matthew 10, 28. And do not fear... Those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Well, that would be God, wouldn't it? Now, this scripture is used out of context. Matthew 10, 28. Really bad. So, Matthew 10, 28. So, here it is right here. They use that word, who, uh, him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. They're like, see, he can destroy them. That's, it doesn't say he's going to. It says he can. It says he is able to. He's not going to. If you die on the earth, your body goes into the grave. Now, technically, you could say the grave is a version of hell, uh, or it's associated with it. But the body's going in the grave. Where's the soul going? It's not in the grave. It's going to the other place where it's hot, where the rich man is hanging out right now. Still wanting Lazarus to come put a drop of water on his tongue. It's eternal torment. All of Sodom and Gomorrah are there. It's eternal torment. Now let's read this in context. Uh, starting in verse 26, uh, this is titled, Have No Fear. Therefore do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, and hidden that will not be known. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Is he actually destroying them? Maybe. But you know, there's a whole spirit thing that's so associated with this too. Because the Holy Spirit dwells with your spirit. There's actually scripture on that. Let's see. Right here. This is John 14, 17, which we actually read John yesterday. So we'll come back to Matthew 10. We got John 
14. John 14, 17, The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be glad with you. Now there's other versions. I think the ESV... Well, the ESV says the same thing. Let's go to King James. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Where is the one about the... What version were they using here? figure out what version they're reading from. Let's take a look. Okay, so let's go through what they're saying here. We got a couple of things. Um, the question was, where does the Spirit and the Holy Spirit dwell in believers, and is there a difference between our spirit and the Holy Spirit? The uh, Bible answer says, the spirit of man is provided at birth by the Lord Almighty in Genesis 2-7, breath of life, Psalm 104-30, and upon our death, the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it, Ecclesiastes 12-7. That's another one that's used. They're saying, see, all the spirits go back to God. You sure about that? Because they missed a lot of context in those. And again, that was Ecclesiastes. And I went there and I showed them. I was like, well, you took that out of context because why is he warning everybody to get God before they die? The whole, almost the whole chapter. When we accept, yikes, when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, he gives us the Holy Spirit who resides with our spirit, the spirit of truth. So the Holy Spirit is a separate singularity apart from our spirit that we're given and Genesis 2 7 and Psalm 104 30. Let's go look at those. Genesis 2 7. See if you understand, there's three parts to man. Genesis 2 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So man, just like the triune Godhead, which is Father, Son, Spirit which ironically can be considered uh, the Holy Spirit, which ironically can be considered Holy Spirit, the flesh, body, and the soul. Man is the same way. Let's, let, us make God in our, let, us, let us make man in our image. Man is a soul, a body, and a spirit. Ironically, just like the Godhead. So, that's interesting. Because now you have three parts to deal with. So, What's going on here? What's being tormented in hell? I mean, the scriptures are clear. It tells us exactly what happens here. Let's go back. Psalm Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. Let's go back to New King James, a little easier to read. You send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. So clearly, there's a, in, a, a situation here where we have been created as three parts, as the Godhead is three parts. Now, we see, again, more proof of... The, the Trinity, which people deny, which doesn't make any sense. They're not reading their Bibles. And we're starting to see scripture here that tells us about this stuff. When we receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit dwells with our spirit. They commune together. Is anybody understanding what's going on here? The only thing that keeps you from going to hell, which is the destination of every non-believer is the fact that the Holy Spirit is there because the Holy Spirit will take you up instead. 
That's why we have to have the seal of the Holy Spirit. Now go back and, and think about what happened to all the people in the Old Testament who knew there was a Messiah coming and believed in it, but a bunch of them didn't. Parable of the rich man of Lazarus. Those went to Abraham's bosom. We see several mentions of it actually in the Bible, in the Old Testament. I'm trying not to use the Old Testament. So, if they were held there, why were they held there? Because the Holy Spirit was not able to indwell fully until Christ finished his work on the cross. So there was a place made off to the side where they could be protected and it was a paradise. When Christ finished his work on the cross and he died, he didn't go to the belly of the earth to suffer in hell for us like a lot of people say. That's ludicrous. That is not what that's talking about. He went to Abraham's bosom to get all those people. They believed. He took them up to heaven. Now when a believer dies, they go straight there. The, the, the veil had been torn. See, as long as the veil was there, nobody could pass through it to go to heaven to be in God's presence. They had to have the seal of the Holy Spirit, the righteousness of Christ, the washing of the blood and atonement, in order to enter and stand in His presence. Does it make sense now why it's so important that you get saved? Because the only way you get any of that stuff is you have to have the Holy Spirit. Go back and look at the wedding feast parable. Hey friend, how is it you got in here with no wedding garment on? No Holy Spirit. Get out. You have to be sealed with the Holy Spirit. You must believe Jesus is the Son of God. That's the only way to circumvent this. Now, if you choose not to do this, if you choose not to receive this free gift... You only have one other place, one other destination for you to go. Now what God does outside of that, I have no clue. He's omnipotent. This is his decision. He told Moses, I'll have mercy on who I will have mercy, and I'll not have mercy on who I will not have mercy. It's his decision. What he decides to do after that, that's his business. What we need to take care of is our sin of unbelief. We deal with that, everything's good to go. He fixes it and takes care of everything from there. But you got to study to learn these things. Now, if people that were believing in annihilationism would take the time to dig through this and understand fully how all this stuff works, clearly they would be like, okay, well, hell's real and it is eternal punishment. Because we don't have a choice of picking right from wrong. We have a choice from picking light or dark. Dark is eternal no matter what. And just because you don't like it doesn't mean that you just go there and get vaporized. You're going to be there the whole time. We have a decision, no matter what happens to us, whether we're dead or raptured, to pick one of these places. You have to make a decision. So it's not like it's unfair for you to go there. You chose it. And you're stuck there. Just like the other direction. We chose it. We're there eternally too. So eternal life has a counterpart or a shadow, eternal death. It has the opposite. Uh, boom. Okay, we did Revelation 2015, Revelation 14, 11, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Revelation 14, 11. Now this is going to be a different group of people. 14. There's 14, 11. The messages of the three angels. So let's go to uh, verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. During the tribulation, God is making every effort to get people saved. There's an angel who's going to be cruising around, preaching. You're not going to, it's not like you're not going to be able to get it. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. This is in the tribulation. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of waters. <clears throat> and another angel follows, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall drink to also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of his holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. What is this? See, I've seen this misunderstood quite a bit too. People are saying that's the mark of the beast. you got to worship the beast in his image. 
I think that's only part of it. But the big clue is, because people aren't paying attention to the little nuances, anyone who worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or his right hand. So it's a two-part thing. It's actually three parts. We have one part active right now. Real ID, national ID. That's not the part that's going to get you hemmed up. It's these two parts. Taking the mark and worshiping him. How do you worship him? Because there's a lot of people that worship him now. You don't choose God. If you don't choose God, you're worshiping Satan. You only have one or the other. There's no in, in between. Because you're falling under his influences and under his control. By not following God. By not choosing God. I know this doesn't make a lot of sense and it's kind of dire. But these, these subjects have to be discussed. This is the full counsel of the Bible. We have to discuss this. I was pushed, I've been pushed to this many times to, to get this in detail because people need to know that there is a counter to everything. There is a reaction and an opposite reaction. And the incentive needs to be established that if you don't pick God, there's only one other place you're going to go. And it's not Club Med. It's not some place to go chill and hang out. It's a very, very bad place, a very negative place. And it is eternal existence without God. So clearly in verse 9 here of Revelation 14, you have to worship the beast as image and receive his mark. So technically it's a three-part system, which I've been telling people that for ever since last year. The thing is, a lot of people already worship the beast. They're already doing it right now. now you, can, you can come up with different ideas of what the beast is, but they're already doing it. It's the mark that's going to separate those who are, are truly his, those who aren't. And that is already exist in existence in the world right now. Verse 10, he himself shall also wear during that. Uh, verse 11, and the smoke of their torment. Whose torment? Satan, his angels, and all the people that worship him and take his mark. And the smoke of their torment, so it's humans, ascends forever and ever. If you're vaporized, how is your smoke ascending forever and ever? And they have no rest day or night. Well, getting vaporized means you wouldn't be in more pain, right? Yet they have no rest, who worship the beast in his image, and who receives the mark of his name. He specifically names the people that will be living on the world during the tribulation that are going to align with the beast. And they will be tormented forever. So again, we've proven it clearly by scripture. You can't misinterpret this or come up with some other understanding. You've got to go deeper into this and to understand exactly what it's talking about. And it is clear that it is an eternal place. Verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Who's that? Those who have faith. Those who walk in faith. Those who believe Jesus is the Son of God. That's the commandment God gave. Faith and love. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Go study more into Revelation 14. Contemplate what that stuff is referring to. Now, here's another one that gets misunderstood. I'm glad this one's in this list. Jude 1.7 Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulge in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Jude 1.7 A lot of people miss, miss this one. So there it is right there, Jude 1.7. Let's read it in context. We're starting verse 3. This block of scriptures is called Judgment on False Teachers. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Remember I told you this? They're in torment to this day. 3,500 3, years later. 
And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. It's eternal. Likewise also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. It is an eternal fire. It is an eternal punishment. It's eternal vengeance. They made a decision... And the really awkward thing about this is that these guys saw the angels and saw God, and he was all over the earth then. He is now, but people don't look at it anymore. And they knew that that was him, and they still turned away. They openly and knowingly rejected him. And he told them, guys, there's only one place for me to put you if you don't reject me. If you don't want to come live with me, I am not. I don't have a special table for all the people who decided... I'll go sit over here with the kids' table. I don't have a special table for you guys to sit over there. If you don't choose me, there's only one other place I can put you, and I have to put you somewhere. They choose to go there. They. It's so easy to understand. It's so easy to make this decision. But if you make excuses, what good are you doing to anybody? It doesn't make sense. So clearly this is an eternal place, and the people that go there are under eternal punishment. All right, um, how many scriptures have I done out of that list? I did a bunch. Okay, let's go to the next one. Eternal damnation. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This has been misunderstood. 6, 23. I did all the book of Romans in a playlist. Slaves do righteousness. So here it is down here. In this whole set of scriptures, he's talking about turn away from these things. Stand with God. Choose God. He's cleansed you from this stuff. He sent you a Savior. Verse 22, But now, having been set free from sin, having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness, and the end, everlasting life. All these people talking about it, you need to bear good fruit. Well, what is he saying right here? Now you've been set free from sin, and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness. You already have the fruit. We work so hard trying to do something that's already been done for us. The fruit's already there. He leads you into other things, but it's already there. We do these things because we're walking in this, setting an example to others. In the end, everlasting life, for the wages of sin is death. And a lot of people will say, see, it's death. You're done. That's it. No. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We've already proven that it's eternal. But they messed mess that up. Now in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Whoops. Come on. Romans 3.23. Let's go to there. That's a long list of scriptures there. So here's 3.23. For all have sinned. What's the penalty of sin? Death. No one is righteous. Let's go through a couple of these scriptures here. Romans 3, 9. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. They didn't have salvation. They didn't believe. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb with their tongues. They have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursings and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And since they don't have that fear of God, they willingly and knowingly walk into destruction knowing that it's a place, eternal place. Their own religion and laws taught them this, yet they still chose it. I don't want to think about that. That's too hard to think about. You can deceive yourself all you want, but the truth is the truth, and it comes from the Word of God. Verse 19, I love this one, because this uh, is um, condemning all those that are preaching law. 
Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. I'm not under the law as a born-again believer. I guess they're still under the law. I feel sorry for them, though. That every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, he needed to become guilty. The whole world needed to, so we'd know we needed a Savior. Therefore, verse 20, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The destruction and the payment for that is death, eternally in hell. That's why we have to choose Jesus Christ. It's eternal damnation. We have Jude 1 7 again. Right here, John 3 36. John 3 36. He who believes in the Son is everlasting life, but he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Everywhere you see the wrath talk about in there, the wrath of God, it's an eternal wrath. They are put under punishment for all time. Simple, easy, there's no problem understanding this stuff. We did Matthew 25, 46 already. Revelation 14, 11. I'm going to try to do this all in one video. Now we have eternal torment. We did Matthew 10, 28, Jude 1, 7. We did uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 9. Remember that. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. It's forever. Matthew 25, 46. Okay, so we did all those. All right, hell. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Let's go to Revelation 21.8. See, these warnings are in here for a reason. So, the new heaven and the new earth, it talks about it, it's going to wipe away all the tears. All, makes all things new. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Verse 7, he who overcomes, you remember in the first three chapters we see who the overcomer is, and then we go to 1 John 5 and see it. It tells you exactly who it is and what we get. So here he's talking about that. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God and he will be my son. But the cowardly, that's those who turn away in shame or they don't want to offend anybody and so they, they pad or water down the gospel, not walking in faith or belief. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, also including hate, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars have their part in the lake of fire, which lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I've seen this scripture used against believers telling, condemning them. That's not about us. It's about unbelievers. A believer can't do this. God will not throw his Holy Spirit in hell. Doesn't happen. This is unbelievers. And their part is going to be in the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone, which is the second death. Now, they also, I've seen this misunderstood. See, it says death. Just because you die doesn't mean you're dead. Because if I die as a Christian, why aren't I dead? We have the Holy Spirit, right. So I go to heaven for eternity. Well, if a person dies without Christ, where do they go? To hell. For eternity. Let's see. Did Matthew Matthew? Did the Revelation twenty ten, Romans six twenty three, Revelation twenty seven. But did all those? We may end up going back to the original one. Okay, so here's Hades. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus at his side. Luke sixteen twenty three. This is the parable. This is it right here. So the parable is, and I've done this one already, there's a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. So now, he's talking to Jews, so he's referring back to Jewish people. So these are people living under the law. Understand the, the concept here and understand the context. These are people that are living under the law, that, that obey the law. This guy, 
being in the law, being one of the God's chosen, one of God's elect, where does he end up compared to Lazarus? I'm sure this guy was really good at giving a lot of money, paying a bunch of tithe, giving gifts to all these guys at the temple, doing all this thing like he's supposed to do. But what, what happens to him? Verse 20, But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at the gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died. Uh, so it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Why didn't he have vaporized? See, this isn't technically a parable. This is actually a story that Jesus is telling. Because Lazarus was a real dude. He's using these different people as an example, but this actually technically isn't a parable. In fact, I don't even think he, he doesn't even refer to it as a parable. So if we get vaporized down there, why didn't he get vaporized in that flame? If, if there's flame, there's fire. He's still there, right? Eternal? But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that no one who wants to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from here, from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. This is important. Listen to what he's saying. Verse 28, For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Because they all warned about this. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. They were warned. We've been warned. Why? Because it's a place of torment. For eternity and you're warned not to go there but if you cushion that story or you, or you take the scriptures out of the way and not believe that it's a place of torment you've now taken away the incentive you've taken away the warning for people about believing because they can just go well, I just don't need to believe then if we're all going to end up going to heaven anyway it's a misunderstanding of the scriptures it's a misunderstanding of the a message God is trying to send which is don't choose that. Choose this. I have this all set up for you. Come here. But people are going to choose that. This rich man knew exactly what was going on. He found himself there anyway. You do nobody any good if you sugarcoat the gospel. It needs to be raw, sharp, and in the truth because it's going to save souls. If people don't think there's a, a, a consequence, I'll just poof and turn to ash, and that's the end of it. I even had somebody tell me, well, but their ashes are still there, so their ashes are going to be torment. That makes no sense. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. Acts 2.27 So there's 27 there. Let's start in verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus, he's talking to Jews. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, and you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified, and put to death. He's convicting them. You just killed your Messiah. The very Messiah you were looking for. But because he didn't come the way they thought he was going to come. The way he arrived was exactly the way the, uh, Isaiah and a couple other books say about him. Whom God raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. He knew about Jesus. Evidently, he saw Jesus. 
Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh will also rest in hope. Resting when? In his life. We're called to rest. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to seek corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. He didn't abandon him there because he believed Jesus was coming. If you believe Jesus is coming, you don't have that. You're not abandoned to hell. If you don't, you're abandoned there. Let's see. Acts 2.31, we read that. There's Psalm 16.10, which is where that quote is coming from. But we're not we're trying not to use the Old Testament. Revelation 20, we did all those. Sheol. Ecclesia oh, it's Ecclesiastes, can't use it. <laughs> I did that Ecclesiastes playlist, you can actually go read that. Psalms, Jonah, Hosea. See, it was a different name in the Old Testament. Psalms, Psalms. Okay, that's all Old Testament. Let's go to this tab, and we have Gehenna. Matthew 10, 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul for him. He can destroy the body in hell. Hell is Gehenna. Same thing. Sheol, same thing. It's just they use different names in different parts of the Bible. Matthew 5.22 But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. We see non-stop mentions of this. Guys, you need to understand the dire direness of your situation. You need salvation. Mark 9.43 And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled then with two hands and go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. This gives you a sense right here that it is eternal. Uh, Mark 9.43 Ooh, Way down here. Temptation to sin. Okay, let's read through this. We're going to start in verse 42. But whoever causes one of these little ones, and this is Jesus talking now. He's the authority, so these are his words. But whoever causes one of these little ones to, who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Why would it be better for him to be tossed into the sea with a millstone around or pulling him to the bottom? If that's better, what's worse that's <laughs> coming? Think about it. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall not be quenched. Where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Whose worm is that talking about? Their worm. Now, I can't give you this as a gospel, but this is um, from First Opinions, you know, chapter 7. Where their worm... There doesn't refer to multiple hells, does it? The sense here is that there is the worm associated with the people that go there. Either they have worms that are going right directly after them to eat their flesh forever, nonstop, or some people have this uh, idea that the, what's, what dwells within us, when all this burns off, it, it's, a, it's like a worm. And that's what's crawling around down there in hell and all that kind of stuff. Like I said, this comes from first opinions. So um, there's no telling exactly what that is, but the warning nevertheless is still dire. Their worm does not die and the fire is quenched. Now if that their worm, if that's actually referring to people and their state when they're down there, this tells you clearly they don't die. And the fire is not quenched. They they are tormented forever. Let's look at the Greek real quick. Um, 44. Let's see what the Greek says. Okay, where their worm dieth not. It's G4663 of uncertain derivative, a grub, maggot, or earthworm. Skolex. Skolex, like a Rolex, only worse. So, 
the fact that it says their worm that that kind of gives you pause. What worm is it referring to? You know, that should make you think for a minute. You know, even if we're wrong about that, even if that, that's our opinion is incorrect. The fact is, he's telling you this is an eternal place and you will be there eternally. Verse 45, and if your foot causes you to sink, cut it off, for it is better for you to enter the life lame than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Twice now we've been warned about this. If he's warning you more than once, once is enough, but is he warning you more than once? It's time to pay attention. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. He has warned us three times in four, five verses. There's only one reason why you see multiple warnings because it's bad and he doesn't want you to be there. He wants you to stand above this stuff, to choose him and to choose heaven. Because not choosing him and not choosing heaven is you automatically choosing hell. There's only one other place for you to go. For everyone will be seasoned with fire and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. That's what we're called to do. But he warns you three times here. Do not go to this place because it is bad and you will not like it and you cannot escape it. It is a prison. If you go there and just get vaporized, why is he warning so much against it? Why is the whole Bible warn against this? Over and over and over again, Old and New Testament. There's a reason why. If you just flash in a pan, you're gone. There's no warning that needs to be. Hey, choose me or don't. Doesn't matter to me. Poof. Most of the people are going to choose don't. They're going to stay with their sin. There has to be an understanding that what's outside of this is death and destruction for all eternity. That's an incentive. I don't want to go there and I'm going to go through that. I'm going to choose God. Now, God didn't make it that way. It just happened that way. But he's trying to warn everybody. And Jesus was trying to warn everybody. Look, you don't want to go to this place. I've seen it. He was. I'm sure he was there probably helping create it. I know about this place big time. You don't want to be in this place. But people are going to do it anyway. Uh, James 3.6 Here's a couple of them. So, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Matthew 23, 23, 23, 33. Matthew 23, 33, way down here. All right, so it's a group of scriptures here. Let me get rid of all this because you can't see it. All right, let's start in verse 29. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you buy or you build the tomb of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we have lived in the day of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. That's arrogance and that's pride because you, I, I, I've seen people say this. Well, if I was there back at that time, I'd have jumped up and stopped them from uh, killing Jesus. No, you wouldn't have. What happened was exactly what was supposed to happen. People have this idea in their head that, that their will is more powerful than God's. Verse 31, Therefore you are witnesses against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Well, why would they need to escape it if it just gets vaporized? Evidently, it's a bad place. You don't want to be there. Therefore, indeed, I sent you the prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. That on you may come all the righteous bloodshed of the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of uh, Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Uh, interestingly, that also is talking to me. 
proving um, about Mystery Babylon. That's just me. Let's see. Uh, Matthew 23, 15. Let's go there. Seven woes. This whole chapter, seven woes describes in Pharisees. Where's 15? Right there. Um, let's see. He's got... Here's a woe. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Verse 13. For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you devour widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. And when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Choose teaching him wrong, teaching him the law. Woe to you blind guides who say whoever swears by the temple it is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold in the temple he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And he goes on and on and on, going, y'all ain't getting this right, man. And what's waiting for you is bad juju. Matthew and Mark about your eye causing you to sin. Mark about your foot. Did Second Peter already. Matthew 5. Okay, so we did all the tabs. Let's go back to this one. Eternal punishment. We had the best success going through here. <clears throat> so we stopped in Jude. Let's go to Luke. 3.17. I'm going to finish this in one video. I thought it might go longer, but there wasn't enough in the other ones. So here's Luke 3.17. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. On the outside, this seems like, oh, he's just going to burn them up. And people have, have said that. Several people have said that to me. But the unquenchable fire is the interesting thing. If the fire is unquenchable, why is it unquenchable if you're just going to get vaporized in there? doesn't make sense. So let's go up and read this in context. Uh, okay, we're going to start in Luke 3, 7. Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, brood of vipers, a bunch of Pharisees and Sadducees came out. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He's mad at them. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Why is there so much warning about this if you just go to hell and get vaporized? That's the easy way out. That's why a lot of people commit suicide. Gun in the mouth, instantaneous, you never feel it. To the temple, instantaneous, you never feel it. So the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and said to them, Who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. A cup of water, visit in prison. The tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to them, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not imitate anyone. I'm oh, sorry, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. Now, as the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, because they thought John, was, John the Baptist was Jesus, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to lose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He was called, this was his ministry, John the Baptist's ministry. Are we not all his watchmen? All, basically, in the spirit of John, we're paving the way for the Lord to return again. Are we not to be reaching out to people? Are we not to be proclaiming the coming kingdom? Proclaiming the coming judgment? Letting people know, y'all don't want to be here for this tribulation. It's a thousand times worse than you can even imagine. Same thing John was doing back then. Are we not supposed to be doing that? Yes. Absolutely. That's why I'm doing these videos. 
His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather into the wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. He talked all this smack, and what happened? They killed him. They cut his head off for it, just like most of the other prophets. Let's see. Here's Matthew. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. You see these warnings over and over again. Uh, did that one here's a really good oh here we go 2 Thessalonians 1 8 through 9 I think there's 2 Thessalonians 2 also so second second Thessalonians, I couldn't get that out. Second Thessalonians 1 9. We covered this one, but there's a couple other scriptures we can put on it. Oh yeah, we did all this one already. But you remember what it says? These will shall be punished with everlasting destruction. It's everlasting. There's no burn up, there's no end to it. You will be there forever. This is an incentive for you not to go there. The wages of sin is death. That's why you need to have a Savior wash you of your sins. But it's not permanent death. It's eternal death. Let's see. Oh, Revelation 19.20. Let's do that one. Revelation 19.20 uh, There it is. So, then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet. Listen, we talked about this earlier. Who works, works signs in, the, in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. They didn't die. They were thrown in there alive. That should tell you, both of these, the beast and the and the false prophet, are, are bodily, they're human in nature, they're physical in nature. Wouldn't they have been burned up? But yet, what did we cover at the beginning of the video? Remember the scriptures? They were still there, being tormented, and it was over a thousand years they had been there. So guys, clearly this is an eternal situation. We can't get out of that because we don't, we can't come out of it because we don't like what it says. Because we don't like the way it makes us feel. Now, here's an interesting thing to keep in mind. Revelation 21.4. Why would he have to do this? And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Why would he have to do that? What are we upset about? What are the other people upset about? People we know are going to end up there, and we're going to know about it. We're going to be aware of it. I know that's going to terrify some people. I know that scares people. I know you don't want to have that thing. I understand people are tender-hearted, but here, the thing is, we have to know the truth. We have to know what's coming, so we're prepared for it. That's why he gave us this book. For us to study it and be aware of all the things that are coming, so that we know what is coming and we won't be ashamed. Will I be shedding tears? You betcha. There's people that I don't even know that I'm going to shed tears for. We're all going to be doing it. The new heaven and the new earth, Revelation 21.1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. The first heaven and the first earth, because that's where uh, death and Hades were, were thrown into the lake of fire. Then I, John, saw the holy city. This is the hell's below us, right? It says throughout the Bible, it's below our feet. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Some people have used this saying, look, 
all that stuff is gone. But it says the the torment will rise up. The smoke of their torment will rise up forever and ever out of the lake of fire. It'll always be there. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the fountain of water of life freely to he who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But, but, the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars have all shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So he said he made all new things, but yet he still, at the end, closes the thought out with, it's still going to be there, and people are still going to be tormented in it forever. That's where it has to go. He flooded the earth the first time to take care of all the evil. He's going to burn it with fire the second time to take care of all the evil. We see that. He's going to burn the whole earth up by throwing it in the lake of fire. Hell is below our feet. How's he going to get hell there? So guys, you got to read this stuff in context. you got to take the time to contemplate this and think about this. It's terrifying, some of this stuff, but you can't avoid it because it's terrifying. You have to be in the truth. And if you're going to be in the truth, that means the whole truth, even if it hurts to read it. Let's see. I think there's. that's it. Philippians 3.19, maybe we can close out with that one. Philippians 3.19. I know this hurts people to know about this stuff, but we got to know about it. So here's 3.19. Oh yeah, we covered this the other day. So uh, we're not going to do the whole thing. We're going to start in verse 17. Brethren, and he's talking about, you know, strive for salvation. Brethren, join in following my example, and note those who so walk, as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. And he's referring to brethren here. This is the scary part. He's referring to brethren as enemies of Christ. They did not receive salvation. They turned away whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. We must be fully aware of what is on the other side of all aspects being given to us within this Word of God. If we deny even one part, we are making a huge mistake. Especially as it pertains to us. Got to be honest with ourselves. All these people that are changing the understanding of what hell is and the fact that it's eternal when the Bible says it is, looking for any one word they can find to try to change it because they don't want to think about that they may have people they know go there. I'm going to know people there too. All of us are. That's the nature of this. We do what we can. This is what another another reason why this is an incentive to be saved. It's also an incentive for us to preach the gospel. To tell them about everything that's coming. Guys, look. You either pick this or you pick that. If you don't pick Christ, you're going here. Well, that doesn't sound very fair. What's fair is, is you're not taking a free gift that's being given to you. All you got to do is reach out and take it. That's it. How easy can you get? But instead what they do is they attack the free gift. They mock the free gift. They scoff at the free gift. If these people are laughing at him and denying the free gift of grace and love he's giving, are they not worthy of eternal destruction? They're willfully doing this. Mocking even the messenger that brings it. Now, we've all sinned and we all deserve this. But thank God that Christ came and he did what he did to save us from this. Because even before he was here, this was already our destination. 
we have a way out of it. It's not like we're not on any one path going any one direction and we have to pick which direction we're going to go. We're already headed there from the day we're born. And we must consciously choose something else. So since we're already on that path, so say you're driving a truck and you're headed right for a cliff. No matter what, all highway, all everything leads to that cliff. All highways, all kinds of cars around you. You've got to make that conscious effort to turn and go to that narrow road off to the side that takes you away from that cliff. We're all headed there. You choose this to keep from heading there, to turn in a better direction. So whether you tell yourself it's real or not, whatever you tell yourself to make yourself feel good about it does not change the fact that in the Bible, in the scriptures, it is in a place of eternal punishment. And all who go there will be there for eternity. That's the truth. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm not going to water it down. I'm not going to, you know, try to hide it under some bread or under the vegetables or something, try to sneak it to you. This is the truth as it's been given to me and everyone else. And this is the truth we need to understand. Do your own studies on this. Do your own right, right dividing and contextual uh, understanding in the word so that you too understand that. Use the Old Testament. Go through all the stuff because it talks about it a bunch there too. But it, you know what? If this wasn't a place of eternal punishment that was horrible for everyone to be, to be there, why would they spend so much time and so much effort warning people not to go there? Just saying. Alright guys, that's all I got. I managed to get it all in one video. Please, please, please don't lie to yourselves. Be honest with yourselves about what the Word of God says. And choose Him. Because once you're there, that's it. You've already messed up. There's no, whoa! You can't dip your toe in and then just, uh, I don't want none of that, and then turn around. It's a one-way passage. I love you guys very much. I'll see you guys in the next video.